Well, our Somerset correspondent David Woodland has been following this story for us all day. He's in Milbourne Port for us tonight. Uh, fair to say then, David, a, a very difficult day for UKIP leader Nigel Farage and, in particular, Mr Wood. He has a terrible day for Alex Wood, Ian. He lives with his parents just down the road here in Milbourne Port. He's only 21 years old, and he's at the centre of a huge political storm after the Mirror printed pages from his Facebook account. One picture shows him making what the paper says is a Nazi salute. He denies that and says he was reaching for his friend's mobile phone with his left hand as the picture was taken in the local pub. They were messing about, he says. The second picture shows him with a knife clenched between his teeth. There's a union flag in the background. He says that was taken years ago and was part of his fancy dress costume when he dressed up as a pirate. Well, I spoke to him at length this afternoon at home and he told me he works for Oxfam, hates racism and he certainly isn't a racist. It's a simple, innocent picture of me in the pub before Christmas with um, some friends of mine. And, um, you know, we were all having a bit of a laugh and um, my friend was taking a photograph of me pretending to eat a, a house plant or something of that nature. And literally, the um, picture that was shown was me going to grab the um, phone off of my friend so I could see the pictures that had been taken. Um, the other picture is, um, I can't remember how old it is, but it's quite old, and it was um, part of a Halloween prank um, where I dressed up as a pirate. Um, the person who took the first picture um, has actually made a statement to the Daily Mail corroborating my uh, statement and she um, also has corroborated the fact that um, I dressed up as a pirate for Halloween because I went to the same Halloween party as her. I'm also going to get a written statement from her too. Are you a racist? Absolutely not. I deplore racism, fascism and Nazism. I see myself as a democratic libertarian and I uh, spend my time, um, free time, working for um, Oxfam, which kind of goes against that. Um, and I also uh, spend time helping out with uh, other good causes such as the Air Cadets. Well, David, a very clear denial there from Mr Wood. Uh, what's going to happen now? Well, one thing I should point out, Ian, before we do that, talk about the future, is he did that uh, so-called Nazi salute with his left hand, and of course they should always be done, apparently, with your right hand. He says that's evidence that he's not a Nazi too. Now, he's been suspended from UKIP, but is confident he'll be exonerated, and he's hoping to be elected still. In the meantime, he's made a complaint to the police of malicious falsehood. He says his Facebook pages have been tampered with. This afternoon, the UKIP leader, Nigel Farage, had this to say. What we have got this morning uh, from Facebook is, is them publicly saying uh, that this guy's account has been fiddled with and that some of the things that have been posted there over the last two days have not actually been written by him. Uh, when it comes to the photograph, well, as I say, it looks ugly, things aren't always what they seem, I'm going to investigate it, and if I think this bloke is tinged by extremism rather than some use, useful, stupid uh, bravado, uh, then we'll do what we always do in these cases and get rid of him. And David, has there been any response from the other candidates standing in the same ward there as Mr Wood? Yes, Ian, the Labour candidate Joe Penberthy said, I'm horrified this sort of attitude has found a place within a British political party. The Liberal Democrat, Damon Hooton, said, Mr Wood's been very silly. He says his account's been hacked. It's not clear if that's the case, but I'm prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt. And the Conservative candidate, William Wallace, said, some parties have more resources to vet candidates. He said it was very wise to steer clear of Facebook. Well, the election is 36 hours away. The voters will have to decide. OK, David Woodland uh, in Melbourne Port. Thank you very much indeed. Staying with the local elections and the Chancellor George Osborne visited a training centre in Gloucester earlier today. His visit was part of the Conservatives' last push in the run-up to polling day. Mr Osborne met some of the apprentices being taught to become engineers and technicians at Gloucestershire Engineering Training. A hundred jobs are to go at an IT company in Wiltshire. The cuts represent a tenth of the thousand-strong workforce at Capita Secure Information Solutions in Chippenham. The company specialises in providing control systems for the emergency services. It faces paying millions of pounds in compensation to the government after failing to deliver a recent contract. 
The robbery of a vulnerable old man as he walked home with one and a half thousand pounds in his pocket has been condemned by police as despicable. CCTV images show the shocking moment the thief confronts his victim in a lift, having helped him through the door just moments earlier. As Richard Payne now reports, it's a crime that has both stunned and angered a community. The images are clear, the crime you're about to see shocking. 10 o'clock in the morning on an ordinary day, this man is plotting an extraordinary robbery. His victim and his wallet spotted, he waits outside the shop for the frail old man to leave with little more than a paper in his shopping basket. As he makes for home, his attacker is never far behind, even holding the door to the block of flats before following him inside. But the polite stranger, scarf now pulled over his face, is about to become a mugger in a lift. Confronted by the criminal, the old man refuses demands for his money. He even tries to leave before the lift door closes shut. Then a struggle for what must have felt like a terrifying time before the thief proves too strong. Casually strolling away, even stopping, possibly to put the wallet in his sock, the attacker escapes. Minutes later, discovering the true value of his crime, £1,500. The victim is still too traumatised to talk about his ordeal, which happened here in the Barton Hill area of Bristol. An area with a chequered past, but one that's trying to build a better future with a stronger sense of community. A community today shocked at what's happened on its doorstep. It will give Barton a bad name. And it's not good to, to come into an area to be known as got people going around mugging old people. No, that's just... I said it's just not right at all, it's not fair. A view shared by police, anxious to make an arrest. It's a particularly despicable crime. This is a very elderly, infirm gentleman who was targeted because he was carrying around a large amount of money. Um, it's a very sad case and this crime is one we're very keen to solve. With such complete and clear CCTV, catching this man and cracking his crime is something detectives are confident of achieving. Richard Payne, ITV News, Bristol. The RSPCA says it's getting more reports of animal cruelty and neglect than ever, but it is doing its best to tackle what it's calling an ever-growing crisis. Last year, the charity secured more convictions for animal cruelty in Somerset than anywhere else in the south of England. Karen Griggs reports. Enjoying the spring sunshine in Somerset is something these collies never used to do tied up in barns, daylight wasn't part of their lives. They're now being cared for at the RSPCA Centre in Brent Knoll. Their owner was banned from keeping dogs for five years, given a two-year suspended sentence and ordered to pay more than £40,000 costs. A happy ending? Not quite. These dogs are now proving difficult to rehome because they were so poorly treated and it's taking time for them to settle down. Their story is sadly all too familiar to John Norman, an RSPCA inspector for 30 years. I think the problem we've got is that uh, a lot of the instances we're catching up with are actually worse than they have been in the past. So we're having to prosecute people which past times we were able to perhaps deal with in other ways. Why? I don't really know why. Um, could be the financial situation to a slight degree. Uh, there are some people out there who seem to think it's all right to torture and kill animals. It seems unbelievable that anybody could be cruel to a creature like this, but the figures show a different story. In Gloucestershire, there's 17 convictions for animal cruelty. In Bristol, there were 43. In Wiltshire, there were 45. And in Somerset, that figure grew to a massive 105 convictions for animal cruelty last year. Hope is a box across. Her former owner wasn't one of those statistics. They were never found. A year ago, she was brought in, starved to the point that not only her bones were visible, but her colon too. She was too weak to even stand. Well, when I saw Hope, and then I saw her at the, the Burnham, even now I can choke up because it's not necessary. You don't have to have an animal. You don't go, and nobody comes up to you and says, you've got to take that dog, that cat, or, or rabbit, or anything. You don't have to take them. You can say, no, I don't want it. And I just don't understand the mentality. The RSPCA are now determined to carry on rescuing animals in need and prosecuting those that mistreat them. For them, hope really does spring eternal for a world where animals are safe. Karen Griggs, ITV News, Brent Knoll.
Well, let's go back to the uh, elections now. And on Thursday, of course, we get to choose who we want to represent us on our big local councils. But in Wiltshire, six councillors have already been chosen. Yes, that's because no one's prepared to stand against them. All Conservatives, incidentally, so they've been returned unopposed. The Electoral Reform Society says it's bad for democracy. Our political correspondent Bob Constantine reports. Pip Ridout has been elected three times before to represent this part of Warminster. Last time she faced four other candidates. This time, none. There's no need for an election because you are the only candidate. Yes, I'm absolutely amazed. Oh, it took me about 48 hours to come down off the ceiling and then think, oh my goodness, I've had 2,500 leaflets printed, my friend has addressed 200 envelopes, and I don't need any of them. Mrs. Ridout is one of six Conservatives returned unopposed on Wiltshire Council and one of five for Warminster Town Council. I just couldn't believe the apathy and you know the general lack of interest from 4,078 people and not one of them put up against me. Her traditional opponents, Lib Dems and Independents, are fighting elsewhere, meaning the results in this part of town are a foregone conclusion. It's a bit like saying at the start of the football season that one team can start with a six-point advantage before a ball has even been kicked. And given that the Conservatives only need 50 seats to gain a majority, that's quite significant. Um, I think it's a bit unfair for everyone that doesn't want that party in, but not much they can do really about it these days, is there? The indication of that, to some extent, is that people are happy with who they've got at the moment. Um, not great, to be honest, because I don't vote Conservative. I'd prefer it to be open for everyone to vote again, to have a choice. Critics say uncontested elections mean councillors don't have a proper mandate. 32,000 people won't get a say where they live their uncontested seats, where the party is so dominant that no one bothers to stand against them. And they, because they don't have 100% support, uh, that really does mean that lots of voters go without their voice being heard at local level. It's a, it's a very big problem and it makes a mockery of democracy. But Pip Ridout says she'd welcome the chance to fight for her seat. Bob Constantine, ITV News, Warminster. And you are watching ITV News here in the West Country. Thanks for joining us tonight. Still to come on the programme, the fishermen's wives are hoping to top the charts with their own brand of distinctive tunes. And the first ice cream of the season, well and truly devoured. Here's hoping it's the first of many as this lovely weather continues. Find out just how long the sun is going to last with the forecast a bit later in the programme. It was stunning today. It certainly it? was. I had a little walk this morning. It was beautiful. Lovely. Let's hope you can Very nice indeed. Now, some users of Bath's new cycling tunnels say the route is dangerously crowded and too dark. Two former railway tunnels were reopened at the start of April after extensive redevelopment. They have proved hugely popular, and that is actually part of the problem, as Laura Making Isherwood reports. It may only take a few minutes to cycle from one end to the other, but if you can't see where you're going or what's coming towards you, it could make things pretty dangerous. You know, they've got the signs here, keep left, keep slow, keep moving, but I think sometimes people just get a bit taken away with the length of the tunnel and how you know, quickly you can sort of perceive yourself to be going. So just go fast. So we go a bit too quickly, does it scare yeah. you a little bit? Uh, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> some cyclists do go too fast. Um, some people don't keep their dogs on the lead. You know, if people got lights on their bikes, well, that's just a, an added bonus, really, isn't it? When you go through without no lights on, well, there, and obviously there could be a small risk element, but hey ho, there isn't anything, isn't there? Since it opened three weeks ago, there's been a lot of interest in this old railway route. Connecting Bath with Midford, the Coombe Down Tunnel is the longest cycle tunnel in Britain. But is it fit for purpose? When the tunnel was opened, Sustrand said that the LED lights in the top of the walls would be enough to illuminate the whole of the pathway. But many of the walkers that we spoke to here said often you can't see what's coming at you until it's too late. This low-level lighting was chosen to protect a colony of bats who have made this tunnel their home. But what about the safety of its human occupants? I decided to test it out. Well, cycling through here with the light on seems to be okay. I can kind of make out what I'm looking at, but 
If I come across anyone without a light, it's really difficult to see them. And dodging dogs and runners is just a nightmare. One thing we are doing in light of the opening and one of the one or two um, uh, emails we've had um, is that we're reviewing the signing of the tunnel. So one of the signs at the moment talk about how long the tunnel is, but actually it'll just be a message about uh, sort of almost a code of conduct, but in much shorter terms, which is all about looking out for each other. Um, yeah cycling at a sensible speed, not having a dog lead across the path, not walking across the path. So we're just having a review of that at the moment. In the next next month or two, there'll be some new signs out there, which don't impact upon the sort of the beauty of the place, but just send out the message to look out for each other and use the path sensibly. The pathway is open for mixed use, but there have been reports of a horse passing through. With mixed abilities, ages and speeds, there's a lot to look out for in the tight space. And if people don't like themselves, they're even harder to spot. Laura Macon Isherwood, ITV News, Midford. A reminder now of the main headline here in the West Country this evening. And a UK Independence Party candidate in the Somerset County Council elections has been suspended amid allegations of racism. It's after photos of Alex Wood making what appears to be a Nazi style salute appeared on his Facebook page. The 21 year old has told us tonight that he strongly denies all the allegations. A group of fishermen's wives, including three from Cornwall, have spent the weekend recording a single in aid of the Fisherman's Mission, a charity that provides support to the industry and their families. Inspired by the military wives' success, the ladies are hoping their medley of sea shanties and hymns will top the charts later this summer. Francesca Carpenter went along to meet the Cornish contingent. Sue Hendricks lost her husband at sea near Newquay 12 years ago. Her and daughter Jenny have joined the Fishwives Choir in memory of Brian. But, you know, you really miss him still. Even now, after 12 years, you still miss somebody. Uh, we didn't find his body till nine days later, and the fishermen's mission were there. And, you know, without them, it, it would have been really hard. Also recording the singles, Hannah Pascoe from Newlyn. Her family's rich fishing heritage meant she was just the girl for the job. Hannah and Sue realised they had more in common than just their Cornish roots. The last boat that Sue's husband worked on before he died was this one, the Lamorna, now based in Newlyn and belonging to Hannah's brothers. It was when Hannah found out this that she knew she had to join the choir. My um, brothers, James and Andrew, bought the Lamorna from Gary Eglinton. She then went on to tell me how her husband um, used to fish from the Lamorna, and so we've got this connection through, through the fishing boat. The woman behind the 40-strong choir is Jane Dolby, who was inspired by the success of the military wives. Jane decided she wanted to raise awareness for the fishermen's mission, who helped her in her darkest hour. When my husband, Colin, died, he drowned at sea and we didn't have a body for nearly a year. And um, without a body, you can't get a death certificate, so I had absolutely no evidence that he was actually dead. And as well as the sort of catastrophic um, emotional price that we all paid as a family, there was a financial price as well because, you know, I couldn't prove to the authorities that he wasn't here anymore. And um, the Fisherman's Mission sort of stepped in, and I don't think we would have survived without them. They helped us financially, you know, spiritually, emotionally, they supported us, they really held us as a family. And I always promised them that once, you know, I felt better, once I'd recovered, I'd do something to, uh, as, as a payback. Fishing's a unique industry and it has its own trials and tribulations. It has the highest death rate and serious injury of any industry or any profession within Britain. It creates a lot of social, economic, emotional and uh, spiritual problems. The single features a medley of sea shanties and hymns and is due to be released in the summer. Francesca Carpenter, ITV News. Oh, we wish them every success. Uh, weather time now, over to Kate who's on Plymouth Ho this evening in the shadow of Smeaton's Tower there. Yes, it's gorgeous up here this evening. As people taking full advantage of the fine weather. Smeaton's Tower, as you say, all getting ready to be lit up later on tonight in support of the culture bid. I bet they're hoping for weather like this in 2017. Sadly, we can't forecast that far ahead. But I can tell you what's happening with the weather over the next few days and how long this lovely sunshine is going to last. So let's take a look now at the details. <laughs> got to make the most of the sun whilst you can. The ITV <laughs> West Country Weather, sponsored by Safestar Windows and Doors. 
So it's going to be a dry and clear night tonight. Perhaps some mist patches forming later on, but certainly nothing to worry about too much. Temperatures sort of around two or three Celsius, but perhaps down to freezing in the countryside. So I think we can expect another widespread ground frost tonight. Tomorrow morning, waking up in the west, it's going to be a bright, perhaps a rather chilly start to the day, but I think that sunshine soon warming things up for us. And then in the afternoon, there could be a little bit of cloud developing, particularly on the north coast of Devon and Cornwall. But I think generally a fine afternoon. It's not going to spoil things too much. And temperatures around 15 or 16 Celsius. Heading back further east, similar story. We're going to see lots of sunshine first thing, perhaps a little bit chilly, but soon warming up. And in the afternoon, bits and pieces of cloud floating around. But again, it's not going to spoil the sunshine. And temperatures, they're above average, really, at around 15 or 16 Celsius. Well, the tie time's coming up next for you. St Mary's 9.06 and 22.06 tomorrow, but please do take note of the times of high water for your area. So looking a little bit further ahead of what's to come over the next few days, and I think there is going to be a little bit more cloud around perhaps on Thursday and Friday. Not quite so much wall-to-wall -wall sunshine, but temperatures still doing fairly well, particularly on Thursday at around 16 Celsius. Now Saturday we'll get off to a bit of a cloudy and damp start, but then hopefully that'll clear away later on in the day and we'll have a much brighter afternoon. So still lots to look forward to. Make the most of it, and I'll have an update for you in the late news a little bit later on. Have a good evening. The ITV West Country Weather, sponsored by Safe Style. Kate, thank you very much indeed. I'm not going to be able to make the most of the evening sunshine, sadly, because I'm staying here for the late news, which is at half past ten this evening. You can go out there and I enjoy yourself. Will. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> and after a short break, the ITV News from London continues with Alistair Stewart and Mary Nightingale. From all of us, bye bye. <laughs>